On today's podcast, we do a little bit of a mashup, bringing you three different topics, talking about sunscreen and the not-so-fun facts around sunscreen and the truth behind that and melanoma, different medications half-life, what, how long is your antidepressant, your cardiovascular medication, your thyroid medication, how long are they actually affecting your body, and then those of you that have chronic UTIs, we talk about why these happen and some common solutions you can start putting in place. Live your life within the moment, moment And don't go wait until the morning, morning You never know when it is over, over All that Welcome I back to the Food Code. Happy Monday. Yes, yes. A new I week. Am, I am driving back from Branson, Missouri right now. Yeehaw. <laughs> yep. That's all I can think about with Branson. I know. <laughs> and I don't even think that it's like that much of like a farm town. It's like well-developed. There's a lot to do there. Um, Just the shows is what I remember as a kid. Yeah, I've never been there. Oh, you haven't? No, my mom's been there lots because my mom is a theater lady, um, thespian. She's a, she's a, that's, I feel like that's the worst word. I don't know. It's just not a nice sounding word. Um, But so she goes all the time. She makes my dad go down with her uh, to watch different shows. Different shows. I've had a few friends from high school actually that have been in shows down there. Really? Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. So. Yeah, well, hopefully you guys are having a safe drive back. Yeah. I'm just here working, you know, holding down the fort, doing the yeah. huge yep. on a Monday. Typically, Mondays are kind of busier days, yeah. but more self-development mm -hmm. days. So um, anyways, if you're new to the Food Code, welcome. You're listening to Liz and Becca on the mic. We are co-owners of Fit Mom Lifestyle, and we run a team of practitioners that help women around the world in our Healthy Gut Happy Hormones program because so many people are struggling with symptoms, struggling, feeling like their body is working against them. They don't know why they can't lose weight. And so that's what we help you uncover is the root cause of why you're experiencing the symptoms that you are and help you resolve those things. So if you're a listener that has been here for a while, we just want to remind you that we do have our giveaway happening this month, which is going to be a free box of Element, our favorite electrolytes, and a free box of First Form Microfactor Packets. So all you need to do, if you've not done so already, is give us a five-star rating and review. We want this to be from the heart, not just to get a product. Um, and once you do that, please email that to info at fitmomlife.com because if you are doing this, we want to be able to get in contact with you. And sometimes people have, you know... Uh, Alien abnormal or, names. Yeah, abnormal names on their uh, iTunes account or Apple podcast accounts. So Sports we just, babe. Yeah, we just need to be able to get a hold of you if you win because we are going to do a drawing for that and then ship these products out to you as a gift for leaving that rating and review, which takes yeah. like two seconds. And it helps us so much. That is how we grow. We don't mm -hmm. do po any type of ads on here. We don't really intend to do ads. Um, so that's how you help us grow and reach more people. So today... You are actually listening to a better version of this podcast than our original recording of it, because some days Liz and I just don't have it, right? Some days, you know, we're not 100%. We're, and I remember the day that we recorded this, and we were both like, I don't want to do podcasts today. We did so many other things today. And, you know, mentally, we just weren't there. But that's not acceptable for you guys, because we're better than that. Mm -hmm. So we redid it for you. So we're so going to be talking about some sunscreen. Episode Part two. Part two. <laughs> New take, and improved. Take two, I should say. Take two. So we're going to talk about sunscreen truths. Medication half-life, which I think is going to be really important for all of you to understand uh, how long medications, different types of medications stay in your system. And ways to combat UTIs. We get a lot of questions about bladder infections and UTIs. So first, let's talk about the sunscreen truths. I think a lot of people are starting to see from the EWG and uh, you know various articles just how we've been fooled yet again with a product that has been promised to protect us. Yet what we're seeing is higher rates of skin cancer and melanoma because of the use of sunscreen. So first, let's understand how beneficial sunlight is to the body. You know, we get a lot of questions just from clients if we're doing blood work, for example. How can my vitamin D levels be low? I'm outside. You know, I go for a walk every day. It's summertime here. And I say, well, are you wearing a hat? Are you wearing sunglasses? You know, because you synthesize most of the sunlight through your eyes to get the vitamin D. And the timing of the day matters. We always encourage 
Sunlight first thing in the morning, this will help set your circadian rhythm, rebalance cortisol and melatonin, variety of um, you know, internal things rely on having a proper circadian rhythm. And the best thing that you can do is if you can't get outside to get sunlight, first thing in the morning is to get like a, a 10,000 uh, lux light on your eyes. So for example, Beck and I both have the happy light in the wintertime here in the West, Midwest when it really sucks and it's dark until like 7 a.m. We'll use that. Um, but either way, what I'm getting at here is that without sunlight, we wouldn't get vitamin D. And without vitamin D, we're not able to get calcium that we need from our diets, which means that we have brittle bones that break easily. Um, you know, one of the things that we saw in COVID in which we will do a podcast on, uh, coming soon, people with low vitamin D levels were at a higher risk. The, mm -hmm. the death rates were higher, um, because vitamin D is so important to your immune system and alleviating inflammation. The sun also releases serotonin in the body, which is like your happy hormone. So you guys think about this. If you have a day where it's really sunny outside, it's a gorgeous day compared to like, how do you feel on those days compared to like rainy yeah. and gloomy? I mean, seasonal depression is a very real thing. Very, very real day. I mean, it doesn't have to be a season. It could just be like a day, a day. Like, man, you're just like, I just want to lay on the couch all day. Right. Absolutely. So we need to understand the benefit so that we can understand why it is not always the best interest of us to completely block, block that benefit, right? Like there, there's a time and a place, right, for sunscreen. We're not completely demonizing it on this podcast. But even certain things like psoriasis, eczema, um, it's been helpful. It's been shown to even help things like arthritis, lupus, IBS, thyroid conditions, because vitamin D is a hormone. Hormones are messengers. You need those messengers to send the right things to the body to do the right things. So we likely probably wouldn't need as many supplements or medications too if we went outside and got more sunlight and if we drank more water with electrolytes. Those two things could probably solve many of your problems. But we do know certain parts of the sunshine can be dangerous. Like we, you know, we do not deny that. So we want to talk about today a little bit around sunscreen and some not so great things that have happened since it's came into an ex ex its existence and set the record straight, basically. So although sun exposure is often blamed for skin cancer, we're going to go through some studies and reveal some findings that say a little bit of the contrary. Yeah. I'm going to actually put the article um, that we pulled some information from because I think we have a few yep. articles here, but there is an image uh, showing direct correlation between males and females uh, in regards to melanoma rates and the use of sunscreen. Uh huh. So if you don't believe us, look to the research because the facts don't lie. And I will say, sure, there's a lot of things that have happened since the 70s the vaccination schedule has gotten mm -hmm. drastically larger. For sure. We've received now up to 80 vaccinations by the time we're 16 or 18. Um, we're exposed to a lot of other things. So like, yes, there's other pieces to the puzzle, but let's talk through some facts. So melanoma, the type of sun cancer that many people think of, was occurring in areas where sunscreen is used the most and melanoma rates are actually the highest among those that avoid the sun and work in indoor urban environments. There was a study that examine the relationship between actually indoor fluorescent lights and an ever rising rate of melanoma. So, and this takes into account things like hair color, skin type, history of sun exposure. And it was found that working under fluorescent lights had doubled the risk of melanoma in the subjects of the test group. So evidence that sun is the causative factor in the development of melanoma is weak and inconclusive Tanned skin from regular exposure to the sun and people who received more sunlight were actually less vulnerable to the deteriorous effects of fluorescent lights. So in 2001, the National Academy of Sciences published a comprehensive review showing something that we talk about a lot, the omega-6 to the omega-3 ratio was the key to preventing skin cancer development. So if you are not familiar with omega-3s and omega-6s, they are both fatty acids that are essential for human health. But the typical American consumes far too many omega-6s through things like seed oil, corn oil, soy oil, safflower, sunflower oil. They are in basically every processed food. They are used in all restaurants that you will eat at. Um, they are very bad for you. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very oxidative in terms of creating a lot of inflammation within the body. Um, and 
they far outweigh omega-3 consumption, which is the real problem. You need both of them. We even use Mm -hmm. some polyunsaturated fats in our protocols, but in very small amounts and balanced with omega-3s. Lots of fatty fish, lots of fish oil, lots of salmon and avocado and things like that. So flaxseed, chia seed. You know, a lot of people don't like seafood or they don't have availability to get good Mm -hmm. wild caught seafood. And which honestly, if you have the option of eating seafood or not, because you can't get wild caught, I would say don't eat it. Get grass fed organic meats um, because what you don't want is more exposure to all the heavy metals and pesticides and hormones coming in uh, through farm raised fish. And you guys can look this up on your own, but you can see very distinct color differentiation. And if you look on the ingredient label, you're going to see that there's ingredients added to color these farm raised fish. It's absolutely disgusting. So Wild caught only, or just choose other grass fed organic sources uh, of, of protein. But, you know, th- we also think about things like egg yolks. We think about red meat, right? Over the years, and we're going to get into this in another podcast around myths, people have been scared to consume these foods, even though they contain a lot of good, healthy fats for us because cholesterol, they're bad for you. So, back to what we're talking about today in terms of sunscreen. So we're going to uncover some facts here. All right. So as Becca has been mentioning, right, studies fail to prove sunscreen prevent basal cell cancers and melanoma. Yet most public health officials still insist that sunscreen use or absence from the sun is our best protection. Oddly enough, as I mentioned before, since the introduction of chemical sunscreen, skin cancer rates have risen. Um, they have, you know, climbed over the years. So melanoma rates have doubled from six to 13 per 100,000 people since 1973. Today, skin cancer diagnoses surpass all other cancer with over 1.3 million new cases each year with new melanoma diagnoses being close to 48,000 in 2002. And this is according to the American Cancer Society. So research shows that sunscreen does not protect against melanoma, the most dangerous form of skin cancer. Lotions decrease the risk of sunburn, yes, because they they block certain UV rays, but they do not block the UVA rays, which are the rays that cause melanoma. So even in the highest protection of SPF here, right, let's say 35 or above, applied in the right amount, we're not effective at filtering out harmful rays. So they say you should limit your sunbathing time and youth clothing to to block the UVA rays when the sun is at its strongest. And obviously we're not encouraging you guys to go out in extreme heat, burn your skin or anything like that. But there's a lot of benefits for you to have raw skin exposure for at least 30 minutes if you can. Um, And then depending upon the time of day, like if you know, you know, between 11 and two, the strongest rays, maybe you're not out there in that time or you're using shade or clothing or a hat or something along those lines um, to help protect you. So We just wanted to bring this up today because I think it's really important to also understand the other effects, which we're going to get into related to estrogen and how some of these things are actually in your bloodstream. So beyond cancer, there have been research studies that have shown concentrations of ingredients in sunscreen found in the human urine only four hours application after application. And so again, remember that your skin is your largest surface organ and it is very absorbable. It is a microbiome in and of itself. This is why a lot of times we get a lot of benefit from, let's think magnesium lotion or HRT, hormone replacement therapy, sometimes is applied topically via your skin, right? There's a lot of ways that you will absorb things and sunscreen is no exception. And I'm thinking about, you know, how does this then get into the GI tract? And, um, you know, we've even seen some of the research showing that for females who were breastfeeding, this has been detected in their breast milk. Mm -hmm. Just absorbing it on your skin. You're just spraying it on your skin. Yep. So there's a couple of different ingredients, oxybenzone, benzophenone. Um, They are very powerful free radical generators and free radicals are very damaging to your cells. That's why antioxidants are so important and antioxidants get marketed so much because they battle free radicals. Um, They are both in sunscreen. uh, They are shown and they have been banned by other countries. So like they have been banned by the European community, Um, obviously not in the US, but those are common ingredients in sunscreen uh, that are pretty dangerous. And then Mm. there's another one called OMC. I'm not even oxy, octi, metho, methoxy cinnamate. 
so many big words, um, can be very dangerous if it gets into the bloodstream. So as far back as the 1970s, there have been different professors that have discovered that as much as 35% of sunscreen enters the bloodstream, and the longer it's on the skin, the more it is absorbed. And then there are multiple other chemicals that are all estrogen mimickers. They are shown to increase cell growth in breast cancer cells. Three of these cells were found to cause developmental problems in animals, especially when mixed with olive oil and spread on the skin. And, you know, basically it was done on the skin of rats at concentra concentrations permitted in sunscreen. So when we're putting these things on the body, they are causing a lot of negative side effects. And can we've talked about estrogen mimickers. We've talked about endocrine disruptors. Sunscreen is no exception here. So the presence and exposure to these estrogen mimickers are, are and should be of concern. You know, they impact your hormone receptors. They basically block hormone receptors. They, inter they are interpreted by the body as the real thing of estrogen and can cause estrogen dominant type issues. You can have heavier periods. You can have Worse things like endometriosis development or P really bad PMS, you know, horrible cramping, things like that, cysts, fibroids. They can, you know, drive breast cancers and uterine cancers, um, disruption of menstrual cycles, all types of things. So what do you do, right? You know, definitely Liz covered on a couple of things in terms of like try to not be in direct sun for too long um, between 11 and 3 p.m., gradually, especially for our children, gradually expose them to the sun, um, especially in the summer months. I have one very pale skin child and I have one more bronze child. Taylor's our lucky one. Um, and you know, I, to be honest, I don't put sunscreen on either of them unless they are in the sun for more than 45 minutes, basically. Um, and in, if it's in top peak hours, then I use specific sunscreen. Um, I use the Yuka app. I really like the Yuka app. I basically just search sunscreen on there and I get different brands um, that are rated excellent in terms of ingredients. And I don't even send sunscreen to daycare. They yell at me, but I'm like, I don't want my kid having sunscreen on them at 10 a.m. for 30 minutes. Yeah. And then it's going to be on her all day long because you're not going to wash it off of her, which right. I wouldn't expect them to. But right. Yeah. So the Yuka app can be really great. And that can be for any product that you want to know, like how toxic is this? And um, we've talked about this before. I think you can definitely get into a place where you're overanalyzing everything, but if you look there and you have a rating, you know, anything that's on the high end of rating, I'm going to toss out anything that's kind of that middle ground. I always say swap out and then anything on the lower end. Cool. Keep that. Um, I personally use the fray skincare. They just came out with one that's, it's a mineral sunscreen. Um, it's got zinc in it and it is SPF 50. So I've taken that with us, um, lots of places and it lasts and, and works really well. So, um, you know, educate yourself question everything. <laughs> um, you know, obviously this has been around for years and years and years. And sometimes we just think it's the norm and we accept it yet. We fail to do the research and really look at the, what the facts are showing us. And I think the EWG is doing a nice job of calling this out now and letting people know that in fact, this has made, you know, potentially, you know, it's one of those things like Becca mentioned before, chicken or the egg scenario, right? Because it's not just sunscreen. There's so many other things that have been happening over the course of the last uh, 40, 50 years that have also contributed to higher rates of cancer. But if this is something you can control, make that swap. Same thing with your hair care, skin care, and other toxic ingredients. So let's talk about medication half-life. Um, so a lot of times when we're working with clients in our Healthy Gut Happy Hormone program, they're coming in on one or more. A lot of times we'll see multiple medications that they're wanting to get off of. They're wanting to get to the root cause. They're wanting to be able to wean off of these things. And in a lot of situations, of course, we are going to have their prescribing practitioner give them weaning protocols and we will guide them along the way from a diet perspective and supplement perspective because your body is not lacking a statin. Okay. Like your cholesterol issue is not a statin deficiency. Your constipation issue is not a Miralax deficiency, right? The list can go on here. What's happening is that we want to look at what is driving the dysfunction in the body. And so when we are working people through, you know, protocols, we will typically take out stimulants. This is going to be things like amphetamines, prednisones, you know, steroids, things like that, a thyroid medication, a lot of times, um, we uncover a lot of thyroid conditions 
including autoimmune conditions, because that's one of the first things that we do on blood work is check everything. Um, things that your doctor have been denying you of or just haven't ran because TSH and T4 is all they typically look at. And then lo and behold, we'll notice that, oh, there's a cellular hypothyroid, uh, you know, dysfunction here, or there are high antibodies indicating Hashimoto's. So moving on from there, we're working on flushing the body of as much inflammation and toxins and, you know, improving the gut microbiome as well as supporting liver and detoxification and so forth. Now we'll get into weaning off of things like over-the-counter um, Prilosec or Pepsid, you know, acid suppressors, acid reflux medications. Um, here's where we would also start to pull out uh, anti-diarrheals or Miralax. Again, depending upon what the person is struggling with, Diarrhea is not ammonium deficiency, right? So we look at the liver and the gallbladder a lot of times, uh, especially with bile uh, and biliary stasis and biliary dysfunction to see what is this person really struggling with rather than just trying to band-aid it with one of these over-the-counter supplements. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, you know, we're looking at other medications that they might be on, um, things that have a short half-life. So blood pressure medications, those are typically in and out of the system pretty quickly. You'll know this if you've ever taken a blood pressure medication, you're going to see that uh, if you were to take your blood pressure just the next day without that, uh, or two days without that, that your blood pressure is going to be high again. Um, Anti-anxiety medications, you know, those are things that we're not really going to touch because when we get into neurotransmitters, these things are ones that you would certainly want to work with your psyche, you know, psychologist or, um, you know, the prescribing prescription practitioner, uh, a physician, because some of these have the longest shelf life. Yeah. Anti-anxieties aren't as bad as antidepressants. Um, antidepressants are very, very challenging. We usually don't even kind of discuss that until our last phase, because once you've worked through detoxification and drainage and kind of getting the systems back online as much as you can, and then working the GI, then we ultimately work on hormones. We work on mood and mind medication, you know, changes if necessary, because hormones are so largely impacted by the gut and by your liver and your body's ability to detoxify itself um, that you don't want to touch them until you have resolved the majority of issues regarding those two systems. So the one thing that you need to understand, though, is that the research on antidepressants long term is not great. Like on, on on SSRIs and all of that, they were they were intended for short term periods. They were intended for eight week, twelve week, maybe sixteen or twenty four week to help people get through hard periods of life, whether it was a loss of a loved one or a traumatic experience or whatever may have been going on. But what you need to understand is that you're messing with dopamine receptors. You're messing with all types of things that affect other areas of the body that affect brain chemistry, it's not just impacting the neurotransmitter. It's impacting a lot of other things. And when people come off of these, some people report up to a full eight to 12 months before they start to feel like the effects of them are gone because the half-life of what they affect, especially the longer that you are on them, is really what we need to understand. So that is why we do everything possible before we even start to touch them because there's a lot of things that can affect your mood. There's a lot of things that can affect your neurotransmitter production that are included within inflammation and gut work. Um, so yeah, it's just something to understand. Like, you know, going on these things is not, a, a, although that seems like a very, oh, you're dealing with some, you know, tough times in life. You're, you're, you're struggling with your mood a little bit and motivation. Here's an antidepressant. Like, unfortunately, that conversation happens far too often um, versus diving into what's your lifestyle like? You know, what have genetics. you tried? What are your genetics? Mm -hmm. What what else is going on? Are, here's some alternatives that are more functional. We use Blisphora a lot. We use SAME. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do that are not as permanent um, in terms of their impact to the body. So yeah. again, we never downplay mood disorders or mental disorders or depression or anxiety, but we need to, we can't turn a blind eye to the true long-term effects of them because no one is studying. No one's sitting there taking notes of, oh, this person's been on a medication for depression for five years. What else is going on in terms of possible symptoms aside from mood? What's going on with their GI? What's going on with their liver? What's it like? No one's studying those things. Yeah. And so you need to understand that you're taking a risk when you're taking these for long periods of time, because a lot of people that we work with have been on them for more than a decade. Yeah. 
Or they're on multiples. Yes. Right. We see that a lot. We also see PPIs for long periods of times. And um, one of the things that we are going to be adding to our practice is genetic testing, because I can only speak to the one change that I've made recently. And this is based upon some very serious things that were identified on my genetics test, which I'm so thankful for. But I have felt more kind of anxious. Um, and looking at the genetics report, seeing a need, I knew that I needed B12 and methylated B12, but I do have the MTHR gene. Um, I have one of the two. So that would be an indication. And we've talked about this before on MTHFR podcast. I've always been against taking folic acid anyway, because I don't like to take things that are synthetic, but in our fertility journey, of course, that's their recommendation, right? Folic acid, folic acid, folic acid. And now I have proof to say, this would be very dangerous for my child if I did this. Um, and in addition, I had some other things that popped up. So I've implemented the Bliss Flora and I've implemented the SAMe. And this is something you need to know what you're doing with it and dosing is you know, correct because you can overmethylate uh, and flip yourself into you know, a state that you don't want to be in. But I have felt a lot more calm, even keeled, just like, okay, like stress handling, um, especially just with meetings back to back and, you know, getting everything done and feeling like you have to juggle everything. So genetics is something that we always want to look at because there's very clear indications on our genetics test of things that we can do both with our lifestyle and with natural supplementation and diet before we have to turn to medications or things that, you know, we can leave our clients with understanding, Hey, in the future, if this situation comes up, here's what you could do to handle it better type of a thing. Um, and then last but not least, we want to touch on UTIs and bladder infections. So we know that UTIs affect females far more than they do males, mainly because of the close proxis, proximity of all of our goods. Lady parts. The lady parts, right? Um, so you think you have your vagina, your anus, your urethra, right? Making it all fairly easy for bacteria to make its way into the urinary tract. So obviously, hopefully you're peeing after sex, you're wiping correctly, all those types of things. Um, but the inability to completely empty the bladder can also lead to infection. This, I would say, is one thing you want to think about in terms of your pelvic floor and actually loosening your pelvic floor. Uh, so you can listen to a podcast that we've done with Veronica Lane on that, where she talks about your pelvic floor being too tight. Um, so anyways, this is typically related to injury damage, or for men, it would be enlarged prostate. Intercourse can also cause UTIs. Again, if uh, female have bacteria from different secretions and lubricants that reach uh, different areas, and then you're not urinating after intercourse. Um, tight underwear and jeans can also lead to infection because there's not enough ventilation. Synthetic fabrics can also be a factor. Certain birth controls, diaphragms, spermicides, condoms, all of those can cause UTIs because it disrupts your pH balance. Um, so there are some things, uh, ultraflora women's is one that I like for mm -hmm. re balancing the acidity of the microbiome and kind of, um, the bacteria there because it is a microbiome in and of itself. Um, and then we also look at the immune system. So it's not just a UTI or kidney issue. It's your immune system. What is happening that your body is unable to clear all of this bacteria because we are meant to clear things. Um, God designed us with everything that we need. It's the fact that we insert a lot of junk into the body and we live in a toxic world that things have become so imbalanced in terms of our gut microbiome and the bacteria, the good bacteria that could help uh, protect us. And again, when we think about antibiotic use over the years, of course, it saved many people's lives, but it kills the good and the bad. So there's definitely an ugly side to this. And a lot of people are simply told Take a probiotic if you have an antibiotic, if their doctor's good and lets them know. Yep. But what probiotic doc, what type of probiotic should I be taking? So this is one we've mentioned on other podcasts, but if you do ever have to take a probiotic, uh, excuse me, uh, antibiotic, always recommend taking a probiotic from uh, Megaspore. So you can do uh, their, or it's Microbiome Labs Megaspore, yep. or you can also do their or IB, I believe it's like a short term. Ultraflora IB. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Metagenics product. Yeah. Yep. Um, and there's some supports that you can put in place uh, that we often will utilize with people that have obviously different types of herbs and, you know, traditional Chinese medicine type based uh, products. So UT Synergy is a product that we use often. Um, they provide microbial inhibition. So basically they are preventing the overgrowth of bad bacteria from coming back. Uh, UT complex is another one that is for people that have like recurrent bladder problems. Think bladder urgency, urinary frequency, you know, overall urinary health. This can be really helpful. 
Uh, if you are currently having a UTI, chronic, you know, or I'm sorry, if you are having an acute UTI, uh, we use D-Manos. Uh, Avo is a very common brand you can find at Walgreens. Uh, we usually do about two grams a day. Ascorbic acid by Thorn um, for four grams a day. Citricidal drops. Uh, any grapefruit seed extract drops can be really helpful. Apple cider vinegar mixed with water. Um, and we usually do that for three to five days if someone is symptomatic. Uh, and then, you know, prevention, there's something called UT intensive chewables. Uh, those have manos, D-manos in it, uh, which is a sugar that doesn't interfere with blood sugar, but they basically the naturally occurring D-manos in it can help to affect certain urinary tract receptors and helps function in a way that maintains a healthier environment in the urinary tract. Uh, and then cranberry forte or cranberry complex because that old, you know, the old tip that you've probably heard your whole <laughs> life of cranberry juice, uh, it works for a reason. <laughs> yep. So the cranberry extract contains high doses of vitamin A, D-manos, horsetail, Oregon grape root, a bunch of different things that all combine to have a very potent urinary tract support. Um, so don't use these products for longer periods of time. Obviously, always consult with your working practitioner to make sure that you should be taking these things. But there's a lot of things you can do that are not antibiotics to help with UTIs. Um, you know, so it's not the end of the world. You know, there's lots of things you can do. And again, what we always ask on this podcast and in general, why? Why are you having chronic UTIs? Why are we always coming in with this problem? There's something deeper going on. So question everything. 